Hello everyone, I'm Yuan. Okay, so this particular topic will be on the first section of pharmacokinetics, which is on the absorption. Right, so uh, pharmacokinetics is divided into A, D, and E. So absorption refers to the first phase because obviously anything that need, that you intake into your body needs to be absorbed first. Then only it can be distributed to different parts of the body and also metabolized, i.e. like detox in your liver and also then get out of the body. Uh, mainly uh, it could go through the renal excretion route. So uh, in contrast to pharmacodynamics, pharmacokinetics is what you do to the body, right? It, because kinetic refers to movement, isn't it? So it's like how the drug, the drug or, or molecule actually moves around, moves around in the body, like how, what you can do to the molecule, right? And also bear in mind that actually uh, this is one of your first classes with me. So a few points to rem uh, as a reminder as well. I normally get questions like which textbooks that you should refer to for pharmacology uh, but to be frank uh, for the topics, the basic topics like pharmacodynamics, pharmacokinetics, the content is pretty similar between different textbooks, very very similar uh, because they are all basic concepts anyway. So I think it's a good time for you to actually find out which is your best favorite textbooks, right? Uh, because uh, finding your favorite book then allows you to use the same reference uh, up to second and third year, even the fourth year. Although uh, bear in mind that uh, beyond your second year, you need to use other references such as guidelines and so on and so forth uh, for your um, reference as well for your pharmacology topics. Right, so which is your favorite book? So in a very short, short explanation, it's basically the book that you love, um, the way it's written, and you can be interested in it, and you can read for it for a longer period of time compared to the others, and won't fall asleep. So this is as simple as that. And also bear in mind that um, whatever that you're learning is actually for your future customers. So the more that you learn about your pharmacology topics, um, you actually, the more that you know and the better that you can serve for few, your future customers, i.e. your patients, right? Um, and hopefully you get lesser mistakes uh, in, in work or no mistakes if possible because always uh, in the healthcare field, um, being careful is a very, very important part of your job, right? Um, because no one can tolerate any mistakes, isn't it? Because no matter if you did the 999th dispensing of, prescri of prescription correctly, but if you did just did one wrong, people will still be angry at you, isn't it? Right, so um, just to con So what happens to the drug after you take it? So if you talk about oral medication, so and also bear in mind that all the medication follows the exact same route as the food because there's no special route for medications only. Everything goes through the same route as the food. So um, as you take your medication, i.e. after your food intake, so everything has to go through a detoxification or any meta pre-metabolization or we call first pass metabolization in the liver because it's just to prevent any toxic substance from entering your systemic circulation. Because obviously, um, for people like me who like junk food <laughs> and instant noodles and things like that, you don't want all those stuff to get into your brain, isn't it? So it has to be detoxified first. Uh, so it has a metabolism process before it actually enters the vein uh, that goes around in the heart and in the lungs and basically all the other organs, right? It goes round and round until it eventually gets excreted uh, through the kidney mainly, right? Uh, but remember this um, metabolism process that I talk about, it could be something that you want actually for the drugs, but most of the time it could be a process that you don't want it to happen because it could actually break down the medications and molecules, so which render the drug inactive. Right? But sometimes it actually is okay for it to happen because it can trans, uh, transform it into an uh, active metabolite. Okay, why do we need to learn about pharmacokinetics? Because you need to understand the drug level changes, how does it change over time, so you know how much to give to a, to a person and when to give to a person. So the main thing is then you can actually do something called TDM. Uh, it's called therapeutic drug monitoring, whereby it's a process which is being a service which uh, performed by inpatient pharmacy uh, in the hospital. Most there are certain drugs that it has narrow therapeutic index, so um, it's meaning that the, the drug dosage 
for it to be effective and the drug dosage for it to be toxic is really really near so you have to push the concentration quite a bit high so that it reaches the the clinical efficacy dose that you want but the, the dose is also high and near to your toxic dose so those are the, the drugs that uh, you have to be careful therefore you have to monitor their levels so what happens is that the doctor will actually take the samples of the drug at the respective required time point and send the samples to the pharmacy department for you to process and do your calculations and make suitable recommendations that when and how much to give for the next dose so there's some examples here so as you can see a lot of it actually IV form for a lot of it uh, but there are some uh, which is in oral form so you have to be you have to counsel them a little bit more like digoxin, phenytoin that's my arrow okay digoxin, phenytoin uh, teophylline so digoxin is for the heart teophylline is for asthma control and things like that phenytoin is for uh, anti-epileptic right carbamazepam, phenobarbital right lithium cyclosporine right so uh, all these drugs most of the time they are more rarely used but if you actually dispense them make sure you counsel them a little bit more cautiously just to remind them about the dose and how to take it right and uh, but there's a lot of other IV drugs uh, antibiotic drugs which you do TDM much more frequently like gentamicin right um, and things like that so those are actually in IV form so the, the patient will actually be in the hospital so it's much easier to change and taper the next dose Right, so for drug deposition, so it's something very, very straightforward actually for pharmacokinetics. Uh, a lot of time it requires a lot of common sense. So plasma is where the blood is. So obviously you want the drug uh, to actually enter the systemic circulation that can go around to different parts of your body and to go to your target sites. So obviously IV form will be the more direct one. You, have, you won't have any loss in your first pass metabolism uh, by the liver as mentioned earlier on, because it's directly injected into the blood. It's good and bad as well, isn't it? But uh, the good part is obviously um, you don't have any losses. Obviously, the bad part is if you have anything unwanted or there's too much inside and so on and so forth, that's it. So unless you have an antidote to clear it up from the system a little bit more quicker, if not, you just have to wait. Right, so, uh, but the other forms, there'll be a certain level of loss. Like mentioned just now, the loss uh, from the, the absorption from the gut to the liver actually goes through something called the portal system, hepatic portal system. So that's a specific name for it. Right, and then it can go and uh, secrete it into bowel again, into, back into the gut. So it depends on how lipophilic the drug is. Right, so, but there's only very few examples which has um, significant... Um, secretion over here through the enterohepatic uh, recirculation details will be at the metabolism class right so there's also other parts that uh, you can actually deliver the drugs of course so that remember the arrows are two ways because from the blood you can also transfer the drug molecule back to all the other tissues in the body right so uh, for the gut and also it mainly the excretion route will be on the urine or it can be through the fecal right and there's the lungs will be some of that from the air as well and also some part about the pregnancy that can go through the baby right and also a little bit about breast milk on breastfeeding so some of it you have special warning not all drugs is useful or it's indicated or safe to be used for pregnant people right so um, pharmacodynamics is what you have learned earlier on so before pharmacodynamics so before the molecule can actually reach its target it actually has to go through pharmacokinetics first so therefore there'll be some um, absorption and so on over here to make sure that hopefully the drug molecule will actually uh, reach the target site as its intended structure then only it can have a response right so there'll be some concepts as mentioned just now ADME will be the short form so for this one we look at the absorption so there's a few mechanisms and some factors so um, the factors here the main one that we're looking at is the main one so the main one that uh, uh, we are more concerned about uh, is the passive diffusion so passive diffusion across the lipophilic membrane layer has to be lipophilic drugs if possible because that would be uh, easier to penetrate through so you can see uh, once it penetrates through you're actually being absorbed by your um, the blood circulation in your small intestine GI um, blood circulation so you can see there's high surface area and there's long blood vessels so upon its absorption uh, the blood circula circulation actually bring the drug away from the site so therefore the concentration over the blood here will be reduced again so again it, uh, it 
uh, creates a concentration gradient so that the drug can be continuously be uh, passively absorbed in the intestinal tract. The other some are uh, the roots as well, like um, the aqueous channel or through active transport, through fifth carrier and also penocytosis or endocytosis. So uh, endocytosis is more uh, prominent for just very few molecules we're talking about here. So one of the examples is insulin through the blood-brain barrier because blood-brain barrier is a very tight barrier. So insulin is a big uh, peptide molecule, so for it to go through, it cannot just diffuse through, so you need this special route. Okay, so you need to know which type of the main movements. So there's also some active transporters around as well, so just to re-emphasize, so you have the certain pumps around. So these are the pumps that uh, some of them is what we don't want, actually, uh, because obviously it's, it's very difficult to get the drug across, and suddenly after it gets across, our body thought that this is something not good. Uh, it's a toxic molecule, we should get rid of it and get out of the system. So it has this efflux pump to actually kick it out of the system. So uh, it's also called P-glycoprotein for one of the uh, very famous examples here. And you know, the other name is called multi-drug resistant protein 1 because it's the same molecule which is available on the cancer tissues, right? Because if it's upregulated by some of the cancer cells, uh, you remember your chemotherapy drugs, um, the concentration that it can accumulate within the cells is much lower than intended, so therefore um, the cells may not be dead as you want it to be. So there will be some cells that survive. Okay, so there are some uptake transporters, so which helps in the absorption of it. So one of the famous examples is this OATP, an organic and ion transporting polypeptide. Right, so more drug will be absorbed across the membrane. So these are some tags of it, right? So um, so you can read through very briefly. It's not something that difficult. Sorry about the motorcycle. Uh, neighbor. So another factor that influences the whole absorption is the this, the gap of the the size of the gap between what we call the gap junctions. So basically, it's what um, the gap between the cells or the endothelial cells in the blood vessels. Because you have to understand that the endothelial, the, the blood vessels is not covered by only just one big cell throughout, isn't it? So it's actually uh, a joint between different cells. So the, the between the different cells, there's these mini gaps. So for certain uh, locations like the liver and the pancreas, so the gaps are actually bigger. It's actually understandable in a way because liver is where, remember, there's a lot of uh, movement of material because you want the toxic material to get into the liver to be detoxified or metabolized and after that the molecules have to get back into the blood vessels again so a lot of in and out movement and for the pancreas it's a, a lot of secreting molecules like insulin and so on that is being it gets into the blood vessels so the bigger the gap is easier for things to move around uh, for the other the other cells the, the other sections of it so there'll be a little bit of gap junction but it's not as huge but the tightest one will be the uh, car in the central nervous system right so because uh, this is where the blood brain barrier is mentioned earlier on so it's a very tight junction because obviously you don't want any toxic substance to enter your brain very easily right but the gap will be a little bit bigger uh, when it, there are certain disease conditions like inflammation and so on right right so oral absorption actually um it's actually affected by the pH of the different sections of the GI tract. So you can see here, this is a very uh, hypothetical form actually. So the plasma pH is around 7.4, right? But the stomach one is between 1 to 3 because again, depends on the amount of acid being secreted at the amount of, at certain time frame. So the small intestine is about 7 to 9, urine is about 8. So you can see the whole section besides the stomach is mainly on the alkaline side. So... Um, <clears throat> and you have to bear in mind the main uh, concept just now that we also say that it's lipophilic. We want something to be uncharged for the molecule so that it's more towards the lipophilic side. Uh, then it can go through the cell membrane more easily. But if you want the drug molecule to be excreted out through the urine way, obviously urine is water, you want it to be hydrophilic, then it can easily be dissolved into the water i.e. the urine. So uh, based on some mere calculation purposes, we'll actually use the, the intermediate uh, num pH number just to make things easy. So we normally use stomach as 2 just for a simple calculation and the small intestine to be around 8. Another point that you should know that many drugs are actually weak acid or weak bases. Obviously you can't make them as strong acid or strong bases because it just can be too 
um, <clears throat> what you call it, too hard, uh, too erosive to the um, membranes right around you. So the ionization state varies. So I'm actually using HCl just because it's the more popularly known uh, acid in a way. Again, obviously your, your drug will be HCl. Uh, so and bear in mind the drugs is actually um, so HCl in a way can dissociate into H plus and Cl minus. So similar for the drug, so this is how we normally write it. So AH is your weak acid, right? So IE like this, A, IE or Cl. So which can dissociate into A minus and H plus. Um, and this is, there's a dissociation constant over here called Ka. And um, bear in mind, this is a double way arrow, so it can go forward and backwards depends on the environmental pH that the, the drug is in. Another one is the base. So base you can see is actually an opposite in a way of the acid. <coughs> because as a compound per se AH is neutral, but for the base it's actually charged form and dissociate into the neutral and the H plus. Okay. So um the main effect of the pH on the oral absorption depends on this particular equation, which is the henderson hasenbach equation. right? So uh, and bear in mind, this is uh, in this case, although you see the, the acidic or the basic drug is actually similarly called Ka, but for the formula over here actually refers to the acidic drug form. So... <clears throat> Another simple way to predict what's happening to the L, the basic drug, is actually just to opposite all the answers of the basic drug if we can calculate it. <clears throat> Obviously, you can remember the equation for the uh, basic drug too. So, but I normally put down the acidic drug, so it's good that if you remember this at least this particular one, so that you won't get confusion, because confusion is the worst thing that can happen, then all the answers will be wrong. <clears throat> so this is pKa equals to pH plus log AH over A minus, right? So it's the concentration form. So you can see pKa of the drug will actually be constant based on the drug that you're looking at. pH will change based on the environment, i.e. it can be in the stomach or in the intestines whereby it's alkaline. So which then influence the value of the, uh, the or the value or the ratio of AH over A minus over here. <clears throat> so obviously what you want in a way is the level or the concentration of AH to be higher, right? So therefore there'll be more of the lipophilic uncharged form, which can then diffuse across the membrane more easily, right? So there's different points over here. So you can see the pH is equal to the pKa, the amount will be similar. So then the absorption can happen. So, but if the pH is lesser, pH is lesser, pKa is more, so to balance up the equation, AH will be more. So there will be more of the AH being uh, <coughs> absorbed across the board, right? And bear in mind, once the AH is absorbed across the board, so this is again uh, to maintain its equivalence, right? Equilibrium. So more of this part will actually go to form more AH as well because more AH is already lost into the system due to absorption, right? So eventually the whole dissociation process would be complete in a way um, whereby the absorption of drugs would be almost complete. <clears throat> right. So uh, if you find it confusing about all the equations, I would strongly suggest you to actually uh, use a pen and uh, paper and pen to actually write a yeah, paper and pen to write down and, and maybe it'll be easier to look at it if you actually write it down, like how you do maths in a way. It's quite difficult to learn maths by looking at the screen, isn't it? <clears throat> this is something to show you. The pKa of the drug is, has nothing to do uh, if the drug is acidic or basic, as you can see here. Very strong pKa doesn't mean that the drug must be uh, acidic. It must be basic. Very strong P, uh, pKa can be uh, acids as well or bases. <clears throat> so I'm just using two examples here, uh, which are a bit could be a little bit more familiar names, hopefully. So basic drugs, it could be like morphine and also acidic drugs like aspirin. Uh, to use it as an ex uh, example for calculation purposes. Okay, so using a specific example for aspirin in this case, we're going to go through what happens at different sections, right? So the main thing, the easier part is to remember the equation. So you treat it like a mathematical uh, question that you need to solve, that will be much easier. Right, so you can see uh, in the urine, you want it to be dissolved form. 
So uh, from the equation, pKa equals to pH plus log AH over A minus. So you can see here, um, when the pH is high, right, it's higher than the pKa, because pKa is 3.5, when urine is about 8, so what you get is that um, the the AH value will be lesser, so therefore the A minus value will be more, so therefore they'll be more in a polar form and uh, to be excreted into the renal way. So you can see, so um, so one of the main uh, routes of excretion will be in the renal. So and the other way around will be for the <coughs> for the acidic one. So you can see if the acidic the the juice if the pH here is about three. So your log here, and this is 3.5, so it's about quite similar. So your values will be quite equal to each other. So you can see there will be more of AH uh, being absorbed in the gastric component. <clears throat> so the pH of the urine is quite similar to the pH of the small intestine. So again, you can see for small intestine, the value of the, the, P, the pH would be... so. The pH value will be about 8, so therefore your A minus value will be more as well. Uh, but this is also, this is very uh, hypothetical form as mentioned. This is main, meaning you're just considering the site of absorption just purely based on the equation only. But you actually have to look at the overall picture, right? <clears throat> so what does the overall picture mean here? So uh, like for example, if you compare the site of stomach versus the intestine, the small intestine. Right, so in stomach, actually the transit time, meaning the amount of time that the drug or uh, which is a, which stays in the stomach will actually be much lesser and much shorter compared to the drug uh, when it's in, in the small intestine. So uh, <clears throat> obviously the, the timing, uh, how long does it take to stay in the stomach will actually depend on factors. For example, if the molecule is taken with food or not for example if it's on empty stomach obviously the, the time of the molecule in the stomach will, will, st will stay very shortly only and then you just go on but if it's with food or after food so imagine it has the, the stomach cannot just release everything you eat in a meal just directly into the next section uh, so you stay a little bit longer in the stomach so therefore there could be more interaction with the food and but there could also be a longer time frame in the stomach for more absorption to occur <clears throat> However, uh, no matter which uh, factor, whether with food or without food, um, yeah. the timing, <laughs> sorry my boy, um, the of the of the drug to stay in the intestine will actually be much much longer. It can be for hours, isn't it? So, um, therefore, um, the overall <clears throat> site of high absorption would still be in the small intestine. So, for exam purposes, if you quote to say that if uh, <clears throat> if the the drug you say the prediction of the main uh, absorption site will be in the st in the stomach. I'll still give you the marks as well because based on the equation prediction, yes, it's in the stomach for some of the cases. But if you say all of it will be in the intestine based on the reasons that I mentioned above, whereby it's a longer time frame and also eventually all will be absorbed. <clears throat> um, and dissociate, remember the dissociation of it uh, will be a double arrow. So... <clears throat> Once it being as being the more the although there's lesser amount of neutral molecules or uh, non polar molecules or non charged ones, um, eventually if, if it's being absorbed across the membrane, so there'll be more of the charged one to to reform into the non charged form, and then eventually get reabsorbed. <clears throat> Right, so uh, opposite will be for the basic drugs, as you can look over here, so that's why it's quite simple, anyway, you can just uh, flip your answers across. Um, so hopefully by then you can understand this diagram uh, based on the equation just now, so you can just read through the explanation over here. <coughs> okay, so now we'll have a look at the basic drug for the Henderson and Hazelbach equation, as stated over here. As you can see, um, the overall effects of the basic drug is actually, as mentioned earlier on, is opposite of the acidic drug. So if you look at here, if you look, if you use morphine as an example, pKa equals to eight. So if it's in the stomach, when pH is about two, so if you fit in all into the equation, you can see that um, to balance out the equation, um, the BH plus concentration has to be much higher than B, right? So therefore, um, the absorption of um, basic drugs such as morphine in the stomach is actually at a minimal level. So 
<clears throat> because the concentration of the unionized form is very, very low. So, um, but at later part of the GI tract at the intestine, where the pH is about 9, as you can see here, so the concentration of B, uh, which is the unionized form, will be slightly higher. Therefore, the main absorption site is in the intestine, right, due to the high surface area. And obviously, the intestine is a longer route, so there's a longer transit time. And therefore, there's um, a continuous um, dissociation of B, of more BH plus to convert into B. So therefore, there'll be more B to be um, absorbed uh, through passive diffusion eventually. There's also some uh, important consequences in terms of the elimination process because uh, theoretically, if, if in case, uh, as a case of uh, what do you call toxicity, overeating of the toxic drug in a way so you can actually play around with the as the pH of the urine to actually increase the amount of elimination elimination so that um, there'll be less toxicity effects of the drug uh, to the person because that's a toxic case isn't it and the person take too much of it right so <clears throat> theoretically acidation of the urine you can actually causes more excretion of the base and more alkalination of the urine will actually cause more excretion of the weak acid. So that's the theory of it. <clears throat> now in practical facts, we actually won't use this way because um, uh, again, like the plasma pH, the urine pH is also controlled very tightly actually. It's, uh, it's, a very, it's not something, although it says that it's acidation, actually whatever value that you can play around with, it's actually very tiny. It's like is you can't really change it from like from eight to, to nine or ten for example no the, the, the changes is very mild it's like point something <clears throat> because uh, if you actually cause so much of a changes meaning there's something very very wrong with your nephron function so um, therefore to actually it's it's you won't really use this route uh, to, to put it in, in, in simple facts um, to change with the pH of the urine excreted um, unless it's you're really desperate Right. Okay, so uh, because uh, you're really desperate meaning you, you also actually change uh, or maybe damage the function of the nephron or i.e. the cells in the kidney. Okay, there's also other factors of that can influence the oral reabsorption absorption process i.e. like the blood flow to the absorption side. So again, it's, it could be depending on the amount of food that you, you take at that time or, or the timing of it actually. Uh, it can be total surface area for absorption so that's quite constant in a way contact time as mentioned just now GI motility so if the person is having constipation for example obviously the amount of time the drugs in the body will be longer compared to the person who is having diarrhea right so um, <clears throat> and also uh, the drug characteristics per se so that would depend on the drug itself which drug you're taking uh -huh. and there also could be some interaction with the food and things like that <clears throat> in the gut as well so that one would depend on the individual drugs so like for example some drugs might form uh, some food like milk in the calcium in the milk might be a chelator i.e it will be uh, will form a very big un insoluble molecule with all the other drugs so that uh, you can't actually absorb it because the resulting molecule is way too huge so here just to reinforce the the concept of bioavailability so bioavailability depends on actually it's a, it's a ratio uh, of the amount of drug that actually um, can reach the systemic circulation as an intact drug actually uh, taking into account of the uh, local metabolism and degradation is something quite important in a way because that will actually influence your drug design for example if the bioavailability is one so meaning it's a complete one so you can actually easily design the drug in a way but if the bioavailability is very very low for example maybe it's 10 percent so it's actually may not be a good thing to actually design that particular molecule to be used as an oral form uh, because obviously um, the meaning you actually have to upload you actually have to give the person a huge dose so that only 10 percent of the drug will actually eventually reach the systemic circulation right so the definition is over here right and how do we get the bioavailability value is by the AUC 
So in the area under the curve, if you draw a graph on plasma concentration versus the time frame, so AUC of the oral form divided by the AUC of the IV form, right? So that you get the value of the bioavailability. So there's, the, there's different factors that influence it. It can be first pass metabolism. First pass refers to the metabolism that occurs uh, in the liver, meaning before the drug actually enters the systemic circulation, it can depend on the drug solubility, the chemical instability, because maybe uh, that's, for example, uh, <clears throat> gut bacteria, for example, that can actually degrade the drugs, for example. Uh, the nature of drug formulation as well, so some of it might be, um, you might design the drug to be delayed release, so that if there's a lot of degradation in the acidic environment, so hopefully the drug can be um, released only in the intestinal environment, so that you skip the, the first part of the acidic, right? It can also be influence of the efflux proteins as well, right? So, and and multiple factors. So all these factors are pretty um, drug dependent, right? So here again to 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 make sure that you remember the time frame for absorption as well. Absorption is not just about the the amount, total amount being absorbed is also about the time frame as well of how you get. So you need to know, obviously, the, the oral form will be the slowest because it actually has to go through the whole GI tract in a way um, compared to the other forms, right? Uh, <clears throat> because you're supposed to get a red lab, but this year maybe we won't get it because of the of our dear COVID situation. But maybe you can compensate later. Okay, have fun, stay fun, and stay safe. See ya!